Good morning. Uh, my name is David. I'm married to Jane and we both worship at St. Andrew's Church where we are members of the congregation. Before we start, I'd just like to pray. Lord, I pray that the human words I speak will be blessed and empowered by your Holy Spirit and so that they will resonate in each of our hearts to bring about the change that you seek in each and every one of our lives. Over the last couple of weeks I've um, been feeling increasingly convicted and therefore thought I should talk on this topic, which I think is a topic that perhaps the church has been a little bit silent upon. And that is the, the sickening events that we witnessed on the 25th of May on the streets of Minneapolis. George Floyd, a black middle-aged man, was just murdered brutally in broad daylight by a law enforcement officer. An enforcement officer whose very responsibility, his primary responsibility, is to save and protect life. I don't think there's a decent person on the planet who wasn't appalled and sickened by what they heard and what they saw. Following George's death, there was an outpouring of grief and protest, and this occurred across cities, across the United States and across cities all over the world. And I know that many people were moved by the cause and could empathise with Black Lives Matter, because they do, they matter as much as every single other life. But unfortunately, subsequent events have muddied the waters. Where there once was a cord, there's now a growing division. The issue that could have been a rallying point for much needed change may now be a lost opportunity. And disunity appears to have won the day. But you know, appalling as George Floyd's murder was, I believe the earlier demonstrations, the ones that we sympathise with, were an expression of deeper issues that have remained under the surface, unaddressed for generations. In a practical sense, there has been some progress. I'm aware of that. In the areas of equality, of justice, of opportunity. But even in those, we have a very long way to go. But deeper, deeper than this, are those issues that resonate with every human being that goes to the core of our existence. As people, we need to be seen. By that, I need to be, everybody needs to be fully seen. We need to be seen as a whole person. We need to be seen as a person who has a history. We need to be seen as a person who has a personal story. We need to be seen as a person of unique identity. We need to be seen as people with hopes and aspirations and needs. Selwyn Hughes, the renowned Christian author and founder of the Christian counselling movement, identified three core needs of the human condition. And these are each and every one of us needs to believe that we have intrinsic value. We need to believe that we and everybody around us is significant. And we and everybody around us needs to believe that they belong. And in the family context, that is, that we are loved. These are the foundation stones of healthy emotional development. Jesus encapsulated this, I think in a slightly briefer, but obviously a more perfect way, when he told us the second greatest commandment was, love your neighbour as yourself. We seem to be a long way off that. One articulate young black man put it like this, no one wants to hear my story and if no one is prepared to listen to my story, I am betrayed by the silence imposed upon me. 
Silence causes distance and misunderstanding. And in its turn, it generates disconnection, leaving us to live apart with our assumptions, misconceptions, and in many cases with our prejudices. And just how true is this today? But wonderfully, there is a but. Nearly 2,000 years ago, at the first Pentecost, 120 frightened men and women were gathered in an upstairs room in Jerusalem where Jesus had told them to go until they received the Holy Spirit. And on that first day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, a miraculous transformation occurred. Filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of God, the apostles left that room from where they'd been hiding and they went straight to the temple courtyard, probably the most dangerous place they could choose to go. And then to compound this, they went to tell everyone the good news about Jesus, the most dangerous message they could speak to the Jewish authorities with Jesus, who had crucified Jesus not two months before. And yet it was on that morning that Peter's first proclamation is so relevant to what I'm talking about today, taken from the words of the prophet Joel uh, in the Old Testament. He announces a new order. These two verses, I will quote them line by line. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In one paragraph earlier in the, uh, in the, gospel, in the uh, book of Acts, we're told that Peter is addressing every nation under heaven. And here it affirms the Holy, the Holy Spirit is a gift freely given to every person on this planet. There are no exceptions to that. The next line. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. The gender barrier has been broken. Men, are all, men and women are all equal under the power of the Holy Spirit. The next line, it says, your sons, no, sorry, the next line says, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. The age barrier is now broken. The Holy Spirit is for people of every age. It's no longer for a select few at a select time. And the last line, even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. The class barrier is broken. Status, position, privilege, wealth are rendered irrelevant into the new order under the Holy Spirit. This was a profound and radical change. A little further on in the book of Acts in chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit at work in the early church as it rapidly expanded. And there was a real sense of oneness, of purpose and of love. And this is in a church that was in part made up of those people on the day of Pentecost who were representatives of every nation under heaven. I think that this is a glimpse church unity as God intends it for us today. I believe a challenge has been set to the wider church, including ourselves. How can we become a church led by the Holy Spirit? A church where human endeavour is always a response to the wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit. A church where love and guidance of the Holy Spirit is not just desirable, but essential, so that we can be a light, a refuge, a place of love and a place of hope to a bruised, hurting and disunited world.